Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are Navigating the Journey. Navigating the Journey is dedicated to exploring the options and choices for end-of-life care and to assist people talking about their wishes. It's time to transform our culture. So we shift from not talking about dying to talking about it. It's time to share the way we want to live at the end of our lives. It's time to communicate about what kind of care we want and don't want for ourselves. We believe that the place for this to begin is not in the intensive care unit. So together, we explore the various paths to life's ending. Together, we can make these difficult conversations easier. Together, we can make sure that our own wishes and those of our loved ones are expressed and respected. If you're ready to join us, we ask, navigate the journey. As you know, we cannot talk about the end of life without talking about the elephant in the room, healthcare. Today, healthcare eats up a major portion of everyone's budget. This is a conversation that every one of us needs to have, yet few are prepared for it. Most of us do not know how the healthcare system works. The Daily News from Washington about the cuts to Obamacare and the chaos that might ensue manages to frighten all of us. Navigating the journey is dedicated to exploring these choices, and healthcare is one of them. Today's guest is Dr. Stephen Kimball. Dr. Kimball has had a long standing interest in healthcare reform, and he was appointed to the Hawaii Health Authority, charged with the overall health planning for the state of Hawaii with designing a universal health care system covering everyone in the state. Welcome, Dr. Kimball. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. First, tell us something about you. You're a doctor, a uh, psychiatrist? I trained in internal medicine first and then psychiatry. And I've always practiced on the interface between the two, at least part of my time. So I work in Queen Emma Clinic and their general medical clinic as a psychiatrist in a general medical setting. I've been doing that since 1989. Uh, but I've always done something on the interface between general medicine and psychiatry. Well, since the body is one, aren't they kind of one? Of course. Okay. <laughs> yeah, of I course. guess you can't have one yeah. without the other, right? Even though a lot of insurance companies like to carve out mental health as if it were separate, it's not. Mm. Yeah. Well, because we are talking about the end of life yeah. and death and dying, um, and the statistics say the majority of money spent on people is that last year of their lives. And nationally, the statistics say that one day in the hospital at the end is $10,000 a day, which eats up your entire estate. So we asked you to come today because you're an expert at all of the minutia of health care and all of the pieces that go into it to put it together and what it is and how it works or how it doesn't work and and your move to universal health care or single payer care mm -hmm. so that is i know that's a tall order but that's where we want to go yeah. so first tell us what is the definition of single payer and universal health care. Are they one and the same? Are they different? What? A single payer uh, means that all the funding goes through one source, which would presumably be taxes, uh, because there is no single source of funding that can bring everybody in other than government. So all the money is collected through taxes, and it's paid out from a single payer. But the delivery of care is left private and independent. So doctors could be an independent practice. Hospitals could be privately owned. Uh, all of them would be participating in the same universal system. Uh, and the other thing about single payer is it's designed to be administratively efficient and to minimize bureaucracy. People often worry that single payer means you'd have a huge government bureaucracy dictating how doctors should practice medicine. It's the opposite of that. Single payer saves money by not having that bureaucracy, by making it unnecessary 
by having a simple, streamlined administrative structure that gets out of the way of what happens between a doctor and a patient. So right now, uh, I saw your PowerPoint. Yeah. And I'm sorry we can't show it because it's much very involved, but much too long for the time we have on the air. So tell us about all these little caveats, these little pieces that now exist that drive up the cost of care. Well, and, and for the doctor, for his office, yeah. or all of those kinds of things. We, we have had um, a, sort of a movement in this country since the 90s to try to control health care costs by restricting utilization of care. Uh, and it started with managed care in the 90s. And the problem with that is if you restrict care or benefits or, you know, those kind of things, you're not restricting people's de diseases. You're not dis restricting the Ill burden of illness in the community. You're just crippling the ability of the delivery system to deal with it effectively. And um, the managed care error resulted in a lot of intrusions into doctor-patient decision-making, prior authorizations attempts to push insurance risk onto doctors and hospitals so they get paid more if they deliver less care, things like that, and it ended up backfiring. Deliver less care? Yes. How is that possible? If you pay a doctor a fixed amount of money to cover a panel of patients, and that doctor delivers less care, they get to keep the difference. If oh. they deliver more care, they have to eat the cost that goes above and beyond what they were paid. Right now, your insurance company gets a fixed amount of money, and they have the risk. And the doctor just takes care of patients, and the insurance company has to pay him. If the insurance company puts the risk on the doctor, then the doctor gets punished if they deliver too much care. So it creates an incentive to restrict care that's put on the doctor instead of the insurance company. Oh, my. Now. That, that's scary. It is scary. There was a backlash against managed care, um, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And then with the, uh, with the Affordable Care Act, we have a new effort that's based on the same rationale. There's too much care being delivered by, because of fee-for-service. Under fee-for-service, if you're paid per thing that you do, you have incentive to do more. If there's a shortage of doctors, which there is, that's not necessarily a bad thing unless the things the doctor is doing are unnecessary. And there are probably pockets in the country where that happens, but Hawaii has not been one of them. We have no track record of a lot of inappropriate, unnecessary care. We have had the lowest per capita Medicare spending in the country prior to the Affordable Care Act. We've had among the lowest health insurance premiums in the country because of our prepaid health care act, which assures that there's broad participation from almost everyone in the community in, in our health care system. Um, so now we have a new thing called accountable care organizations, which is the same idea. You pay groups of doctors and hospitals a fixed amount up front, and they carry the risk, and they have an incentive to deliver less care. The people that designed this knew that there was a perverse incentive in there, so they inserted counter incentives, which is pay for performance and risk adjustment. Pay for performance means we're going to ask you to measure the details of what you're doing. We want detailed documentation and data reporting to either Medicare or your health insurance plan. And they're going to analyze that data and decide whether you're delivering the right care, the most cost-effective care, even though managers with metrics have no idea what's happening at the individual patient level. Uh, well, that was my next question. Are these people that are reading the data, are they medical people? No, Do they're they managers. Oh. Between, so, between 1970 and the present, the number of doctors in this country has doubled, okay. roughly doubled. In the same period of time, the number of managers and administrators has gone up 30-fold. Oh, my. So we're being inundated with micromanagement of the details of health care. So is that why it costs so much? Yes. This is by far the biggest driver of excess costs is the administrative bloat in our complex system and the attempts to micromanage care. How do we get... How do, we, how do we get out of that? Or, or can we? Well, I, no, I think, I think there definitely are ways to get out of that. What, what I would do if I were designing a system, and I got appointed to the Hawaii Health Authority, which is supposed to do that, but we've never been allowed to. What, what, do, you I would, mean, what do you mean you've never been allowed to? The Hawaii Health Authority, by Hawaii law, this is passed in 2008 over Governor Lingle's veto. It says we're supposed to design a universal health care system covering all residents of Hawaii and determine what benefits, who's 
a participating provider, all the details of the plan, set policies for health care for the state. We worked on developing plans for three years after Abercrombie appointed us in 2011. But at the same time, the Affordable Care Act passed, and he pivoted to trying to implement that and threw us under the bus. The legislator gave, gave us $100,000. He took it away, gave it to his other health transformation initiative, and we were never allowed to have any influence on policy. But you did do the work. We did, we did create a game plan mm -hmm. for how to get there. It's not down to the level of detail that would be necessary for implementation, but it's a guideline of what direction to go to get there. Go ahead. Good. So that what's includes, in the pack? Yeah, what's in the pack? Right now we have a rat's nest of perverse incentives and counter incentives in healthcare. Uh, our fee-for-service system is skewed toward procedures, so there is an incentive to do unnecessary procedures. To counteract that, they're pushing insurance risk onto doctors, so they have an incentive not to do unnecessary procedures. To counteract that, they have pay-for-performance, which creates huge administrative burden. So it's this rat's nest of things. Instead of all that, let's go back to making physician pay and hospital pay as incentive-neutral as possible so that the doctor's only incentive is to follow their professional ethics and do what's right for the patient, using their knowledge and experience and expertise, do what's right for the patient, and get money off the table as a way to try to manipulate the situation. Then all the micromanagement becomes unnecessary. If we really implemented this, we could save 20 to 30 percent of what we're now spending on health care. So with this health health care authority, yeah. Is that what it's called? Hawaii yeah. Health Care Authority? Hawaii Health, Health Authority. Authority. What do we have to do to ensure that the Hawaii Health Authority is in business to plan, implement a single payer? Is that correct? Or universal health care, which is there, what? Your original question was universal health care versus single payer, and you don't necessarily have to have single payer for universal health care. Okay. And I'm going to, to but, get you back on But we would want at least a unified delivery system yes. where all doctors and all hospitals are participating. They're all paid the same regardless of the source of funding for a given patient, and they all have the same um, benefits, same prior authorization policies, same formulary. The delivery system is unified. You can have one funding stream or multiple funding streams, but the delivery system has to be unified to get those administrative savings. So, so we could get that bloat out, is Right, it? right. So I'm, I'm, I'm stunned by all of this. I'm trying to filter it out. I'll tell you what, we'll go to break, and then I will think about this and see if I can't make sense of it. Well, we do have the law already in the books. It just needs to be implemented. Okay, thank you. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, meeting people we may not have otherwise met, learning things we may not have otherwise learned, helping us understand and appreciate the important things about Hawaii. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Hi, I'm Marianne Sasaki, and I'm here today to tell you about the Women's March on Washington on January 21st. It's an incredibly significant march in which all, both men and women are going to stand up for women's rights, women's reproductive rights, and all the rights we've accrued over the past 40 or 50 years. There's also going to be marches in each city, uh, on each island. There's one in Oahu. I urge you to join a march and stand up for women's rights. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I serve as senator from the Big Island on the Kona side, and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on Think Tech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our health care system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting Think Tech. Hi, we're back. And we are talking about my new best friend with Dr. Stephen Kimball. And he is guiding us through the maze of healthcare and how we can get it on track to something we can understand. With the chaos in DC about the Republicans doing away with Obamacare with nothing to replace it. And we in Hawaii have approximately, or at the minimum, 300,000 people on Medicaid 
that just scares the bejesus out of all of us as to what's going to happen with the cuts. So Dr. Kimball was beginning to tell me about the Hawaii Health Authority and how we can get back on track to protect our people in Hawaii. Dr. Kimball. Okay, the Hawaii Health Authority is in Hawaii law. It's HRS 322H. Uh, all we need to do is have it implemented so that it can do what the statute says it's supposed to do, which is to design a universal health care system covering everyone. We would need the, uh, the governees to appoint the members. The, the current group of nine members, their terms have expired uh, last, a year before last. And uh, so a new authority needs to be appointed. Um, and three are appointed directly by the governor. Three from a list supplied by the Senate president and three from a list supplied by the Speaker of the House. But the governor appoints them all. So you need the legislature and the governor on board say we, we need to do this appropriate some funding for administrative support. But the Hawaii Health Authority would not actually run the healthcare system. They would be setting the policies that guide the healthcare system. That would guide, you know, med the Medicaid program. It would, it would guide um, how the funding goes for state and county employees, commercial insurance, um, all of those would, would come under the policies set by the Hawaii Health Authority. Now, just a little deviation here. Yeah. I mentioned the 300,000 people on Medicaid. Yeah. Would you explain to the audience the difference in Medicaid and Medicare? I mean, you know, so many of us use yeah. it interchangeably. Well, both were passed during the Johnson administration. Uh, Medicare is for the elderly and disabled, and Medicaid is for those below a certain income level, for the poor. And there are other, some people that qualify for both. Uh, Medicare is basically a federal program, although it's been partially privatized into Medicare Advantage plans. And Medicaid is a federal state matching program administered by the states, and each state does it differently. But it's made about 85% federal funding and 15% state funding right now in Hawaii. So now, but those are, will those be affected by the, this change in Obamacare? If we were to be able to have a unified delivery system with, with a, a unified funding stream, you would need to capture all those different funding streams. So we would need waivers from Medicaid and Medicare to say instead of those funds going the way they no go now through various routes, we would have them go through this one mechanism that paid doctors and hospitals the same regardless of where the money came from for a given patient. And we would need federal waivers to implement that. One thing that Trump has said that's a ray of hope in all this is he said he wants the states to be free to do their own thing. Maybe he would actually let us do something sensible, unlike what many of the other states would want to do with that. That's scary for some of those yes. states, <laughs> but we can't deal yeah. with that. Yeah. So um, I see here that you are a board member of Physicians for a National Health Program. So does that mean that physicians across the country are working like you are for this universal health care? Yes, uh, Physicians for a Nas National Health Program is the physician advocacy group for single-payer health care, universal health care for the whole country. And uh, I joined them soon after they were founded in the late 80s, and I've been a member ever since, and I'm now on their advisory board, and I've been active with them. So, as, so I would assume that they are before the Congress right now as the director of health department is being vetted? Well, they, they uh, tried to influence the discussions that led to Obamacare and were thrown out by Senator Max Baucus. Some of the PNHP members who were asking to be, participate in the discussion actually got arrested. Oh, my. For trying to say, include single payer in the discussion. That's because all these people were getting paid by the insurance lobby. Was, that was my next question. And shut question. out the yeah. single payer advocates. So what happens here, today is the opening of the legislature. Yeah. What happens here when you go back to the legislature and say, reinstate the Hawaii Health Authority? Yes. So if I go back today and say, re with my picket sign, we're going to reinstate health, would the, you, the uh, insurance people be out to kill it? Uh, probably. Um, they, the original eight members that were appointed by Abercrombie, we never got the ninth, but the original eight members represented a range of disciplines. They were uh, 
community advocates, physicians, nurses, social workers, um, various uh, people representing different interests, but there were none representing the insurance industry. And we worked very well together. We, everything we did was approved unanimously by that group. It was a remarkably effective organization because it didn't include anyone who was determined to sabotage the whole process. So, but right now, given this climate yeah. that we're in, if, if this, and I, I hope it will come before the legislature in this session, in fact, this morning, uh, uh, Senator Takuda, Jill Takuda, who is Ways and Means, she said that she expected health care to be one of the top issues. Yeah. So if it does come before her, and I would hope that whatever you want it to be will be there, can we, do we think the insurance people will lobby against it? The insurance business model profits from denying care. It profits from micromanaging doctors. Uh, so they have a vested interest in keeping things complex. Every time some new thing like Medicaid managed care comes in, the insurance companies promise they're going to make health care more cost effective, they're going to reduce waste, they're going to make sure people get the care that they need, and the outcome, and save money, and the outcome is always the opposite of what they said it would be. Our cost, since Medicaid managed care was implemented in the 90s, our costs accelerated faster than the national average. Physician participation declined, access to care got worse, ER and hospital usage got worse, even though the opposite of what they said the program was supposed to accomplish happened, the legislature won't go back. They won't say, we made a mistake, we better stop doing this. They double down on it. And we all know what, if you do something that doesn't work and you keep doing it, what do you call that? <laughs> yes, insanity. The insanity, yes. Uh, and the insurance lobby will push to do even more of what they're doing now, add more administrative burdens, more micromanagement, more costs, and it will continue to drive our costs through the ceiling. Well. We are here to talk about the end of life. Yeah. And as I said, this is a, the elephant in the room, is health care. Yeah. And at $10,000 a day, that's, that's incredible. That just, it just blows your mind. Yeah. So those of us that are looking, because I'm 78, so the end is in sight. Yeah. So those of us that are looking at this, what can we do? How can we support this uh, reinst reinstatement? Is that, yeah. is that what you're asking for? Yes. Reinstatement so that we can get a handle on this because we can't budget for the end of life with all of the craziness, the chaos that is going on in the healthcare system. What can we as ordinary citizens, how can we help? What, 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 how do you see our role in this? Because. I, I, I can't talk about end of life without looking at the cost. It, that's just very real. We can't look at $10,000 a day and see grandma's estate gone. Well, the, the way pricing is done in healthcare is extremely complex and opaque. Nobody understands it. I, as a doctor, have no idea what it's going to cost when I prescribe medication or, any, or anything else, and neither does anybody else. And it keeps changing all the time. So even if you figured it out at one point in time, you'd be out of date a week later. Um, I would pay, like I said, I would pay doctors in, in an incentive neutral way, just pay them for their time and get rid of all the micromanagement. Um, right now, well, part of that $10,000, about a third of it, is the administrative bloat in the system. If you had an administratively simple, streamlined way of paying doctors and hospitals, you could take 20 to 30 percent of that out of your health care costs. And you would also unshackle the doctor so that they would be able to negotiate with the patient what was in their best interest without having to constantly report data to an insurance company and justify what they're doing and jump through hoops in order to get paid. Oh, this is all too much. This is all too yeah. much. So, uh, yes, and then they get to deny they say, well, you can't stay in the hospital but two days. Or, so, or the insurance company says to the doctor, we pay you X amount of dollars. Your incentive now is to deny care. So you're the one that has to tell uh, Granny that, oh, we're going to cut off life-saving equipment because um, the doctor will make more money by doing so. Nobody wants that if they are seriously thoughtful about what it means to be in that position near the end of life. So 
Yeah, and they, they say, oh, you can't do this, or you, we can't keep you in the yeah. hospital, but, but you're obviously at the end, but we can't keep you because the insurance company says we can't. Yeah. So, again, I'm back to my question is, yeah. how can we assist? What do we have to do? Like I said, this is the opening of the legislature, and for anybody that doesn't know, in Hawaii, this is a big deal. The opening day of the legislature is really a big deal, and all the lobbyists yeah. will be there. Right so, now, both Medicare and HMSA are pushing a capitation model for primary care A doctors. capitation? That's paying the doctor a fixed amount up front for care, and then the doctor takes the risk. That's what capitation is. I think the public should oppose that. It, it puts the doctor in an unethical position. I think the public should oppose that, and they should oppose the insurance companies being the driving force in health care, and let the Hawaii Health Authority design a system that's designed from the ground up to be cost effective and re to be responsive to patient needs first. Oh, this is all too much. This is all too much. Yeah. This capit oh, capitation, we, we have to talk about that again. I, I, this weekend, or last weekend, was the commemoration of the Dr. Martin Luther King. It was the Martin Luther King holiday. And Dr. King said America's forgotten civil right was health care. And I quote, and I'm going to read this because I won't get it right. Of all the forms of inequity, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhuman. Dr. Martin Luther King said that at a national convention of medical committee of, for human rights in March 25th, 1966. And here we are, 52 years later, still talking yeah. about the inequities in healthcare. Yeah. So, my audience, you know I'm a, a political junkie. I have been a part of this whole movement for years and years and years. We need you to be out there. We need you to support this issue at the legislature. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for being here today. I have enjoyed so much. I've learned so much. Capitation. We've got to do it. Got to fight that one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. I love you.